Hey everyone, Bethany here. I just wanted to give a little trigger warning because there will be some sexual topics, including reports of abuse in this episode. Listener discretion advised. She was a lovely girl. Such a lovely face. She'd grown up with shiny people in a warm, safe place. But he had impossibly blue eyes. What a nice surprise. Let's live it up, darling. You can take a ride. Slowly she walked forward toward echoes of a bell. As a warm shiver ran up her spine, she thought, this could be heaven or this could be hell. She got a lot of pretty boys that she calls friends. Her sister gone before her didn't make it to the end. Pink champagne, they all know your name. Let's toast to the ones at the top of the game. The thrills are so high they'll put you right to sleep. The paranoia won't set in until at least year three. Among the shiny people here, You'll never truly be known. There's a vacancy in the air, and a cold man on the throne. You'll always be lonely here, but you'll never be alone. The wonderful world of golden stars is now your new home. This isn't what you wanted, not where you thought you'd be. But your brother needs the hookup. How could you ever leave? Now the pretty faces have a second side. But she's already rolled her dice. Drifting to sleep, she heard a ghost whisper. We're prisoners here, of our own device. Welcome to Blood and Business. I'm Bethany. And I'm Cassie. Today we're telling a story of siblings born and bred to run the world. They were the most infamous family of the 20th century. Their story drips with conspiracy. Their names whispered through the decades since they left their voices echoing in time and space. Their hands helped mold the America we know, sharing with their country dreams of landing on the moon, freedom for every man. And by example, they inspired generations to reach the highest heights. They played with fire, and only a few survived. Their words ring through our history books, their pretty faces on our television screens, and their signature will forever be stamped on our national identity. They stood in the trenches. We stood beside them. They flashed their diamonds, We flashed our cameras. They had their fun, and we saluted them. They were good, they were evil, they were human. They are the Kennedy siblings. Pat was in her first year of college in Philadelphia, her first time living away from home. In the same fashion that she avoided Norriton, she managed to attend Rosemont Catholic College instead of the staunch and austere Manhattanville Secret Heart like her sisters had. Arriving to college, Pat made quite the entrance. Not only did she arrive late, not only did she show up with trunks, multiple trunks of clothing, she also brought to her dorm room her very own bed. <laughs> When the dorms were being shown to visitors, her room was always off limits because of the mess. Mrs. Thomas Joyce remembered. Well, she's definitely a Kennedy. (laughs) She's a Kennedy. She was the tennis champion as a freshman, one of the most popular students, and a head taller than everyone else. Pat did not have the star power that Kick did, but she did have undeniable glamour and poise. She was a Kennedy with quick wit, and a short attention span who captured all of the attention the moment she entered a room. She was stunning, but she did not see it. She felt average, the middle girl with brown hair surrounded by shiny personalities and gorgeous people on all sides. She even signed some of her letters to Kick as Fatty Patty. And to Jack, she wrote, Write me sometime when you can move that beautiful body of yours to a pen and ink. And so, maybe, it's why she was so swept off her feet when she met another shiny person on Madison Avenue, New York City, in 1954, who told her she, too, was shiny. 
Peter Lawford had the charisma. So like Black Jack in New York and Jack in Boston and D.C., Peter was known as the eligible bachelor of his day in L.A. and in England, for that matter. Remember, Peter was British, he was handsome, and he was a successful Hollywood actor. Eunice actually met him first, and she was the one who first introduced Pat to Peter, but nothing came of their initial introduction. Ooh, and definitely remember this for an upcoming episode because there is a bit of red string here. They met again in 1949 at a party in London, but Peter was dating somebody else at the time and gave Pat enough attention for a friendly nod across the room, and that was it. In February 1953, Pat was on a ski trip in Switzerland when she read in the paper about Peter's father, Sir Sidney Lawford, passing away. So she sent him a letter of condolence, but was sure to sign off with a suggestion of furthering their relationship. Quote, Do let me know if you come to New York so we can do a better job of meeting than our last crossing. This was while she was still working for NBC in New York City, and allegedly, according to the Kennedy women, the Kennedy women had Rolodexes of eligible bachelors on file. <laughs> this is the red string that Bethany's talking about. It was true. They were not only keeping tabs on eligible bachelors for themselves, but also potentials for each other. In November of that year, Pat was heading down Madison Avenue in a floor-length mink coat to pop out and pick up some groceries <laughs> when she ran into none other than Peter Lawford, who immediately asked her out for a date. This occasion was followed up by many more meetings. That Christmas in 1953, Pat brought Peter home for the holidays. And though Joe Sr. normally thought that actors were narcissistic frauds, he told Pat only that, quote, he seems like a nice man. Pat was approaching 30 quite quickly. And this is the 1950s we're talking about. So she was starting to sweat a bit. It was common for Kennedy girls to wait a lot longer than most women at the time. But Pat was more than ready to pull the trigger by now. And she was a mastermind the whole time. She had not one, but two options. And as the story goes, she had just a few nights left in New York with Peter before an upcoming trip to Japan to visit the other man that she was seriously dating, Frank Conniff. This trip was to convince him to propose. But before she leaves, she sees her opportunity and makes her move. On her last night in New York, Peter leaned across the table and said, I'm crazy about you. I'd like to marry you eventually. How about April? Pat immediately replied. You're pulling my leg. Peter shot back. April what? Pat said, next April. Peter stammered out something along the lines of, I didn't mean real marriage, especially not now. I meant the idea of marriage in some far off Neverland future alternate dimension. <laughs> Pat let him know that that was fine then. Frank Conniff was still available and she was leaving in the morning to seal the deal with him instead. They said their goodbyes. And then the more days that passed and Peter thought of Pat in Tokyo with someone else, he began to feel differently. He called the Tokyo Hotel and said, Okay, Pat, please come home. April, it will be. Pat responded, I accept your eloquent proposal of marriage. And got on the next plane back home. I wonder if marrying Frank Conniff was ever even a real thing. With the way that she got out of going to Norriton by failing her exams, I'm going to go with no. <laughs> <laughs> it was all by design because she's a mastermind. When they announced their engagement, Pat and Peter had been together for a total of two months. Oh. His best friend at the time, Joe Nair, said this, quote, Peter was being courted by everyone, society and Hollywood types. Pat was only one of many, and Peter was terribly impressed by who she was. This doesn't presume to say that he wasn't taken with her as a human being, but the fact that she was who she was didn't hurt. He didn't want to marry Lana Turner or Ava Gardner, but somebody outside of the business who meant something socially. I hate saying that out loud, but it's true. Mm, who else married for prestige? Jackie, Jack, kick, the list goes on. 
And maybe this was why he was convinced to make the call to Tokyo after just two months of dating. Quote, The spark was never there. On her side, yes. Not on his. He thought it was time for him to get married, and she was appropriate. He liked her, but I never thought he loved her. Milton Evans, Peter's longtime manager. Pat had grown up pouring through the pages of the magazines her dad would bring home, especially for her, and dreaming of living in a sparkling world when she got older. The Kennedy Women describes that quote, Her courtship with Peter was like a movie, full of witty dialogue, enough romantic suspense to keep things interesting, and fade to a happy ending. The fact was, however, that Pat knew hardly more about Peter than some starstruck fan in Omaha. She was far more sophisticated and more widely traveled and better educated than most of the stars and starlets of Peter's professional life, whose world was confined to the parameters of the studio lot and who were rarely as interesting as the roles they portrayed. Once they were officially engaged, Pat and Peter went back home to Hyannisport to tell Joe and Rose. Last time, Joe said he seemed nice. This time he said, quote, If there's anybody I'd hate worse than an actor as a son-in-law, it's a British actor. (laughs) I do not think the ambassador had gotten over the whole World War thing quite yet. As soon as he heard, Joe Sr. called his good friend, J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI, and asked for a full report on Mr. Peter Lawford of the United Kingdom. Quote, The FBI report, dated January 29, 1954, stated that Peter had been investigated in 1946 involving, quote, white slave activities in Los Angeles. He had contact with a Hollywood madam that year, and four years later, the report noted a call girl was reportedly a frequent trick for movie actor Peter Lawford. Joe allegedly decided that what he found in the report wasn't severe enough to prevent the marriage. I guess the pot can't call the kettle black with the whole promiscuity thing, but what the heck is the white slavery thing? I have no idea, but it does not sound good. Some speculate that Joe knew how much Pat wanted to marry Peter, and Joe didn't want to lose her the way he lost kick before they really lost kick. Rose was concerned about religion, of course, but even she was satisfied with the promise that though Peter wasn't, any future children would be brought up Catholic. Peter's mother was... Mm, Kudos to Pat for dealing gracefully with the situation, honestly. Lady May Lawford, doing a very quick and totally bogus diagnosis, I do believe she was a narcissistic mother. She was obsessed with her son and lived vicariously through his accomplishments. She had bred him for stardom and viewed him as an extension of her own identity. And on top of how unfair she was to Peter, raising him in a very warped reality, she was just outright mean to Pat. She had wanted Peter to marry into European aristocracy, not some inferior famous American family. The Kennedys, in her eyes, were nothing more than, and I quote, barefoot. Irish peasants. Which was catastrophic when I read that. I feel no words. No words. Horrible because to us, me and Bethany, we picked up this vibe of the Kennedys that like they just didn't care what people thought. Like celebrities are people too. Yeah, basically. Like they're so rich and unrelatable, but they're so relatable. Yeah. We thought that we came up with that to like dis the like staunch prim and proper uh, society deb vibes just so we're clear on where we stand (laughs) okay lady may lawford she had different thoughts pat specifically according to peter's mother was a b-i-t-c-h who had quote trapped her beloved son she could not handle another woman in her precious son's life barf Despite her treatment, Pat tried to pay respect to Lady May by bringing Cardinal Francis McIntyre to the L.A. Lawford home during their engagement. Lady Lawford expressed her distaste for Pat's guest by turning to Pat and asking why she brought a chaperone. Quote, 
Do you think Peter will rape you? <sighs> this is one of the most horrible things I've heard. I don't know. Okay. And just out of <clears throat> nowhere, like you, what? To Lady May, the Catholic Church was a peasant religion of a peasant people. I mean, this is not good. Did Peter stick up for her at all? Or do we know if he said anything? Tried to protect her? I'm not sure. I don't really see anything like that. Pat felt that it wasn't her place to confront the woman, so she kept as much distance as possible. And I think it was very hard for Peter to confront his mother as well. James Spada said this about their relationship. Quote, I really blame his mother, Lady Lawford. She put it into his mind that he had no intrinsic self-worth and that anything of value in his life he'd have to get from associations with other people. And even the people he chose to associate with clearly weren't good enough. It would have been a crushing relationship, Peter and his mother. When the war hit in 1939, Peter's family had lost their source of income and were unable to come up with even the appearance of wealth anymore. Peter was also an aspiring actor, just as his mother pushed him to be. So he moved to L.A. and picked up a night job working as a valet for powerful Hollywood people like Joseph P. Kennedy. Eventually, he did find success as a high B, low A level actor, quit parking cars, and was able to save up $100,000 from his movies. In the context of Peter's mother, instead of the usual Kennedy combat tactics, Pat opted to pull in Jackie's method of operations. <laughs> Lady May had thrown her this extravagant bridal shower in LA to show off to all of her snooty friends. And on the day of the party, Pat showed up two hours late in casual athletic clothes and then left with Peter almost immediately after arriving with the claim that she did not feel well. The other thing that Lady Lawford picked out to attack constantly was Pat's drinking. Here's Buddy Gallen, who wrote Lady May Lawford's autobiography. Quote, Lady May never shut up about Pat's drinking. Lady Lawford was not used to a young girl drinking. I think Pat took an immediate disliking to her. Lady Lawford was pointing out all these things that were wrong, from drinking to the wedding plans, but the Kennedys had no use for these leftover Victorian ideas on how to behave. Also, if you're curious, go look up what Gallen titled her autobiography. It's delicate. Isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? We just, we can't not. <laughs> <clears throat> Peter and Patricia Lawford were married in April of that year in the Roman Catholic Church of St. Thomas More on the Upper East Side. Twelve days before her 30th birthday with a lovely spring-themed reception at the ever-so-humble Plaza Hotel. Oh, that's why, April, she barely made it. To the public, this marriage between the suave British star and the lovely heiress was the stuff of movie magazines. Everywhere the couple went, they were pursued by photographers and reporters, whether it was wandering through Central Park or walking hand-in-hand -hand at the Palm Beach Country Club. Lawrence Lemer. But just to show you the power that is and was the name Kennedy, while on their honeymoon in Hawaii, they went to a drive-in, and after the film ended, they played a newsreel. And in an instant, plastered across the screen, looming above them, was written, Pat Kennedy marries actor. Peter was crushed. Rob Guild remembered. He was just crushed. They hadn't even used his name. The Kennedys. They weren't normal celebrities. We're Kennedys. Sadly, this also confirms everything his mom was already telling him. Yeah. Unfortunately, in terms of sexual relations, Pat and Peter had opposite levels of exposure. Though Pat had met many of her father's mistresses during her childhood, as Rose taught them to, Pat and her sisters completely denied themselves the knowledge of who those women really were. And at the time of her marriage to Peter, Pat was still a virgin. Quote, About the world of sex and male-female relationships, she was not only innocent, but dangerously uninformed. 
That reminds me of what Kick's friend said in episode seven. I knew it happened to animals. I just didn't associate it with human beings. The more I think about what? that, the like, oh my gosh. the more alarming. Yeah. I knew what happened to animals. To animals. animals. <clears throat> that was pretty much what Pat was working with as well. Peter's life was the opposite. Quote, To him, sexual preference as to gender, number, or technique was no more a matter of morality than choosing between fish and meat for dinner. Peter was sexually abused very early on, and so, like Pat, had a very skewed relationship with sex. Each mistreated, but in opposite ways, and Peter obviously more severely. His mother, quote, dressed him in girls' finery in private until he was almost ready to enter puberty. He was about 10 years old when his nanny began fondling him, performing fellatio on the pretty little boy. According to Merriam-Webster, the meaning of fellatio is oral stimulation of the penis. It's speculated that an uncle adds to the list of people he should have been able to trust that abused him sexually when he was a kid. Quote, He talked about sex with Pat, or rather the lack of it, said Evans, Peter's manager. Peter wasn't as brazenly open and obvious about his infidelity as Joe Sr. had been, but Pat knew it was there, and she shouldn't, couldn't, and wouldn't stand by. Quote, when Peter married Pat, he did not screw around, Evans continued. He'd go out of town and there would be a masseuse or something like that with whom he had his way. But what's wrong with that? That's not screwing around. He was with some pretty good women, some proficient women. But you're married. She's the mother of your children and you live the life. Mm, he had a very different definition of screwing around than me or Pat. Like Jack and Jackie, Peter and Pat performed as much for each other as they did for the world. Peter's affairs had destroyed all intimacy and trust between him and Pat, and in return, Pat used her words as nuclear weapons against his pride and personal identity. They tried to merge every part of their lives, but their own deepest characteristics, the most fundamental parts of themselves, were like opposing sides of a magnet. No matter how hard they pushed, they would not join together. It was the upbringing. When Peter's fourth and final wife reflected on what Peter had told her of Pat, she said this, quote, I think he loved her a great deal. It was their first marriage and there was a strong friendship. But he was incapable of loyalty and she was innocent. In fact, Back in the day, Peter himself had proudly stated, quote, Pat's the only girl I've ever met that I could be married to. Regardless of how things ended up, Pat was never just one of many to Peter. He hadn't married anyone else, had he? They ended up staying together for 11 years before finally divorcing in 1965. They had four kids together while they were married. Peter obviously had other relationships, but never had any more kids with anyone else, and Pat never remarried. I don't know why, but that absolutely crushes me. I have many thoughts. We will talk about it in the KFM. But once they were married, back in 1954, they settled in Santa Monica, California, and became the life of the party. This is the mansion on the beach that hosted the likes of Marilyn Monroe herself. This is that mansion. They also grew close to another very popular movie name, Judy Garland and her family. And Judy gave birth to her son, Joseph, at the same hospital and on the same day that Pat gave birth to her son, Christopher Kennedy Lawford. Once actually in the Hollywood scene and seeing the black and white movie stars up close, Pat realized they had drier skin and more wrinkles than she did. But... It was still fun. The one person she still hadn't met and was dying to was take one shot in the dark, Beth. All blue eyes. 
ding, 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 Frank Sinatra. Peter said, quote, Boy, did you come to the wrong window. <laughs> <laughs> For he was maybe the one person in Hollywood with whom Frank would not have been open for a hangout. Frank Sinatra. He was a character. When we think of him, we think, my kind of town and you make me feel so young. But Frank's off-duty persona was a bit more risky. So buckle up, listen up, ask me if you have any questions. And if you're not Bethany, just rewind. (laughs) You see, Frank had lots of friends in lots of kinds of places. The White House, Hollywood, Cuba, Jersey, Chicago, and some of these friends, namely the ones in the latter few places, were a bit problematic as they were murderous mafia members. Some were even banned from the country, hence the Havana Nights. So when Peter Lawford had to tell old Frank that he needed to back off of his brother-in-law, the president, it was a tense moment. But Let's back up, shall we? Francis Albert Sinatra was born in Hoboken, New Jersey on December 12th, 1915. Just kidding. We are not going all the way back. But just know that his childhood was intense, starting with his birth, from which he had literal scars. His mom loved him, but was abusive and gave endlessly confusing signals. His dad was a fighter by profession, but after breaking both wrists at once and not being able to read or write, decided to take up day drinking in bars. Frank grew up in an Italian immigrant neighborhood. His dad came through Ellis Island when he was 12 years old in 1904, and his mom was also an Italian immigrant. Both families landed in Jersey. The story goes that Frank got caught up in the wrong crowd as a kid and inherited his mom's entitlement and temper. A star was born. A star that somehow reasoned that as an A-list celebrity, he could show up at nightclubs, casinos, and racetracks with the largest known mafia bosses in America without the FBI knowing or caring. (laughs) Frank was a bold and interesting main character in his own world. On February 11th, 1947, Frank Sinatra flew with Joe Fischietti and his brother Rocco to Havana, Cuba. This was a noteworthy trip because the Fischietti brothers were previously members of Al Capone's Chicago gang, and they were flying together to bring $2 million to the boss of all bosses. Charles Lucky Luciano, who, quote, Born Salvatore Luciana in 1897 in Sicily, probably did more to create the modern American mafia and the national criminal syndicate than any other single man. And one Frank Sinatra, who campaigned for one, Jack Kennedy, is flying out to meet him. I mean... When Frank flew out there, they were having the largest mafia meeting since the 1920s. And Frank thought it would be believable that he just happened to run into some fellow Italian Americans at the hotel in Havana and struck up a friendly conversation, you know? (laughs) It is. It's fine. Allegedly, Lucky greeted Frank like an old friend. Oh. Frank explained to the famous Hollywood gossip columnist Hedda Hopper, quote, I was brought up to shake a man's hand when I am introduced to him without investigating his past. Any report that I fraternize with goons or racketeers is a vicious lie. <laughs> he literally flew out there with mafia captains. That's Frank. This quote was obviously before the photographic evidence was published. (laughs) When Bugsy Siegel, one of the other celebrity mob bosses who was integral to the founding of the Las Vegas Strip and who worked under Lucky Luciano was murdered, 
a certain Frank showed up in the crowd of mourners to pay his respects. And Sinatra is already fighting the reputation that he is a draft dodger. The American people were wondering if the Kennedy boys and Elvis were overseas fighting. Well, then where was Frank? And who pocketed the money? He did have a perforated eardrum from literally being ripped with forceps from his mother's tiny frame as a 13-pound baby, hence the scars from his childhood. And in reality, that may have exempted him from the draft, but he clearly didn't fight to enlist as one Jack Kennedy had. <clears throat> his eardrum, but he can hear musical notes just fine. In addition to the questions about the war and his questionable friends, Frank's career was suffering from his very public and scandalous affair with Ava Gardner that destroyed his marriage. All of this to say, at this point, the American people had Frank Sinatra's reputation on the rocks. He was emotionally all over the place by his own recollection and was desperate for recognition and respect. He went so far as to approach the FBI and offer himself as an informant multiple times. <laughs> Clyde Tolson, deputy director of the FBI, said, and I quote, We want nothing to do with him. J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, replied simply, I agree. Years later, when police raided Lucky Luciano's home, they discovered a gold cigarette case with the inscription, To my dear pal Lucky, from his friend, Frank Sinatra. That is so incriminating, it sounds like a setup. So the Kennedys are on their way up. Their star is rising. They are just getting started. And Frank needs a ride. <laughs> He had always supported the Democratic Party. He pitched in with Truman's re-election campaign in 1948, along with a couple of others. And despite his corrupt connections, every candidate that he offered to campaign for responded with an ecstatic yes. For as Michael Sheridan put it, while everyone was afraid of mobsters, everyone wanted to know Frank, especially the mobsters. <laughs> Frank explained, some people say I may hurt my career taking sides in a political campaign, and I say to them, to hell with this career. Government is more important. Michael Nelson believed that, quote, Sinatra's hope was that political involvement would cause the public to associate him with statesmen rather than mobsters, with public service rather than hedonism, and with dignity rather than volatility. Lucky for Frank, he met someone. Back in 1953, have you ever heard of the infamous gossip columnist Luella Parsons? She was the spoon in the story that was the golden age of Hollywood. Always stirring things up. Well, Luella published a bit of gossip back in 1953 that Ava Gardner was seen out at dinner with a shiny new actor named Peter Lawford. Frank and Ava had just broken things off despite Frank's pleading and seeing this news absolutely sent the man. In reality, it was a purely friendly dinner between Ava, Peter, another friend, and her manager, but the damage was done. Frank was seeing red. He called old Peter up, screamed for several minutes, including a threat to arrange for someone to break Peter's legs. Several people intervened and tried to convince Frank that Peter had not replaced him, and Frank eventually did drop the subject. But he would not speak to Peter again for five years. Peter believed that Frank's threat was good. Also, I do think, and I do think, <laughs> that Ava and Peter actually did date a couple times very briefly later on, but I can't be positive. Every account that I read on this specific situation, though, maintained that it was a misunderstanding. But the fact that Peter hadn't been with Ava that night 
was a miraculous exception to his rules for life. Peter had been with Judy Garland, Lana Turner, Ann Baxter, June Allison, and many of Hollywood's ladies of the night. And maybe several men of the night, too. There were rumors about Peter for days. One story was that when he signed as an actor to MGM, his mother requested her own salary as his assistant. When Louis B. Mayer said, uh, no, she argued back that Peter needed to be supervised around the clock because he was a homosexual. I don't believe she convinced MGM to give her that job. And wow, knowing who his mom is, regardless of his preferences, the fact was that Peter was a sex addict when he met Pat. Quote, She was one of the purest people I'd ever met, Peter remembered. I could really just cry from anger for Peter and Pat. Pat was her mother's daughter. Mary Jo Gargan was Pat's younger aunt, and she remembered, quote, I just started going to college. Pat said, you'll have a much better time if you don't drink. Pat was my idol. She was a beautiful girl and just had everything as far as I was concerned. And remember what Luella Hennessy said in last episode about how Pat was always so full of joy and gratitude and laughter yes. and just how thrilled she was with any small act of kindness. I think most of us have the wrong idea of Pat. Pat's golden opportunity to make her Sinatra dreams come true was served on a silver platter in August of 1958. So at this point, Pat and Peter were married four years? Correct. Pat has been patient. And now, here is her moment at a party thrown by Gary and Rocky Cooper. That afternoon, Peter had some sort of minor accident on the set of a TV show that he was filming, and he burned his hand, which made him late to the party. So Pat was wide open to spend the entire dinner laying the Kennedy enthusiasm on Sinatra. He was thrilled because of how knowledgeable she was on politics. (laughs) Go figure. (laughs) When Peter finally got there bandaged up and rushing in, Pat immediately said, guess what? With no condolences about his injury. I just had dinner with Frank Sinatra. He's charming. She invited him to come to their house for drinks, and Frank accepted. And no one really said much about the whole breaking of the legs and the five years of the ice. (laughs) Quote, Pat was taken with Sinatra, not in some hopeless romantic crush, but in unabashed admiration. Frank had a charm of such incandescence that when he shined it at Pat, it blinded her from seeing anything else about the man. Pat was pregnant when they met and started showing shortly after. Frank had a tradition. When any of his friend's wives were pregnant, he would fly the couple out to Vegas to gamble with him so that he could tout the pregnant mom around like a good luck charm, making them feel especially special. When Frank Sinatra was nice, he was the best. Sinatra was such an outsized personality that he swept people into his life, transforming them. Sinatra suddenly stood at the center of Pat and Peter's lives. They started seeing him two times during the week, usually a movie screening at Frank's. Kind of uh, similar to her upbringing. (laughs) Oh my gosh, Getting to see all the movies first. And then a dinner at the Lawfords. And every weekend, they drove to Palm Springs to stay at his vacation home. They were there so often that they started keeping some of their casual clothes in the closet of the guest bedroom. When Pat gave birth to the baby girl that she was carrying, it was on the election day that Jack was reelected to a six-year term for the Senate. And so she named her new daughter, Victoria Frances Lawford. Victoria for the victory. That was her big brother's Senate campaign. (laughs) Frances. Can you guess? Because of Frank Sinatra. When Pat named her daughter's middle name after Frank Sinatra, they had known each other for a total of three months. Mm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. 
had her had her clothes in his closet and her baby girl named after Frank Sinatra. So two months in and she's engaged. Three months in and she's naming her baby after you. But she's 30 years old, so she obviously doesn't do this with everyone. Yeah, that's what's so confusing. With Peter and Frank, it's like, boom, boom. Whoa. But clearly this is not a pattern because... You're maybe it's maybe once she crossed, crossed the, the Rubicon, Rubicon, she was like full send. I no longer have fear of commitment. Let's just get commit to everyone. So yes, if you didn't catch that after three months of friendship, Pat named her child after Frank Sinatra. Eleven days later, she and Peter bought the rights to a screenplay called Ocean's Eleven and brought Frank in on production. So they were playing and working, and kind of living together. Soon, Peter was formally invited into Sinatra's group of entertainers, who called themselves the Rat Pack. And once inducted, Frank landed acting jobs for Peter left and right. When Frank was nice, he was real nice. When Peter first told Frank about the Ocean's Eleven story, Sinatra joked, Forget the movie. Let's pull the job. (laughs) There was always an underlying tension when they were around Frank. It's like a thriller movie where everything that's actually happening is great and it's exciting and there's nothing really going wrong. But in your gut, you're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Your subconscious knows that there's something about the person or the situation that just isn't right. That's what hanging out with Frank Sinatra was like. And Pat knew there were stories. There'd be stories. There would be letters. (laughs) It was my daughter's in law that I told. There were stories of Frank Sinatra assaulting photographers or slapping women across the face, but Pat did not know how dangerous Frank was, how dangerous his friends were. Finally, on New Year's Eve, she would get a better picture. Pat and Peter went to Romanoff's, the famous Hollywood restaurant where all the stars hung out for a party thrown by the owner. They were sat at the most coveted table in the dining room with Frank, Natalie Wood, and Robert Wagner. Pat had just given birth two months before, but she's a Kennedy. So here she is out on the town with the best of them. The whole table had planned to drive to Frank's place in Palm Beach after ringing in the new year, but it was freezing outside for LA. So the two women, Pat and Natalie, being in dresses that were no match for the cold, suggested waiting until the next morning to make the drive. Frank was heartbroken, infuriated, devastated, all the aideds, gets up, says, Happy New Year's my ass and storms off into the night alone. So everyone awkwardly goes home to their own beds. And then the next morning, Pat and Peter were wondering whether they should drive out to Frank's or if the invitation was no longer standing. So Peter called first, and the butler answered. When Peter asked how things were going and if they should come down, he said, quote, Well, I guess, Mr. Sinatra, I guess he's really pissed off about something. How so, George? Peter asked. (laughs) He came in and had a couple of drinks. Then he went into the room where you and Mrs. Lawford stay and took all of your clothes out of the closet. What did he do with them, George? Tried to make a bonfire out of them by the pool. When the fire wouldn't get going, he threw everything into the pool. Peter hung up and laughed to Pat at the pure ridiculousness. What will the sweet man do next? She said. Peter was genuinely upset about his favorite pair of jeans that were in that closet. Pat told him, We'll age another pair. Just make sure you don't take them down to Frank's. Three weeks later, Frank called, and Pat and Peter were back in Palm Springs. Just as quickly as Pat pulled herself close to Frank, Frank was pulling himself into the jackpack. Frank provided the party. Jack provided the significance. In November 1959, 
Sinatra attended a Kennedy campaign event in Los Angeles, and afterwards, he and Jack had dinner before going back to Sinatra's place with Jack's close friend, Dave Powers. Frank shared Hollywood gossip like a water hose of information, and in true Kennedy fashion, Jack ate it all up. (laughs) At the end of the trip, Dave remembered that both he and Jack agreed on what a wonderful host Frank Sinatra was. During Jack's presidential campaign, Sinatra campaigned for Jack in Hawaii, New Jersey, and even officially renamed his standing show at the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas and called it the Jack Pack. Later that month, Pat and Peter went to Hawaii with old Frank. This was a trip that would change Jack's life forever. And we still don't know how many consequences it brought about. Pat and Peter stayed in a conjoining suite with Frank and a new and very noteworthy character was staying in that suite with him. One Judith Campbell Exner. She had never dated Sinatra before this trip, but admitted on the first evening that they had been busy together that day. Campbell remembers that her first impression of Pat was that she was strong-willed, mildly disheveled, and an obvious side character in the movie that was these larger-than-life men's lives. Always with the disheveled and the Always with the disheveled. (laughs) While the two couples were out to dinner on this trip, two of the waitresses flirted incessantly with Frank and Peter, completely ignoring Judith and Pat. Judith remembers Pat aggressively grabbing a cocktail napkin, scribbling a note on it, and then shoving it across the table to her. It said, I still think they're full of shit. Later on the same trip, when two other women showed up at the hotel room to give Frank and Peter massages, Pat was outraged. Joe Sr. noticed that married life was taking a very large toll on Pat. She had never been much of a drinker before, and he noticed a big change. He was worried enough that on June 25th, 1956, he wrote to his bright and softest daughter, Take very good care of yourself. Don't drink too much scotch, nor smoke too many cigarettes, and stay up so late at night. How you stay so beautiful doing all these things is the eighth wonder of the world. Jackie and Rose, when in the same position, chose to build an emotional bunker for themselves inside their marriage. To the best of their ability, They went on, ignoring the world of sin and betrayal they unwillingly found themselves living in daily. Pat wasn't about to do it. She used alcohol as pain management and decided that if Peter wasn't going to be loyal, then she shouldn't either. And with that, Pat began to have entourages of her own. Peter didn't agree with the logic and became incredibly possessive. Once he started to have suspicions of her affairs, he brought the warfare, the FBI, the mafia, all the nasty things that had slowly seeped into their lives. He brought it all fully into their home. He started with a wiretap. Quote, He was so cheap he didn't want to pay for a guy to do it for him. I gave him the equipment and showed him how to install it and hide it. Fred Otash, a retired L.A. police officer turned celebrity blackmailer who disguised himself as a private investigator. So, at this point, Pat doesn't belong anywhere. Not at home with Peter. Not in this Hollywood circle of plastic friends. Not back in Hyannisport anymore. And because of her husband and her friends, Jackie doesn't even want her around her big brother now. Jackie thought that Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, really the entire Rat Pack, were dangerous, and she was very weary about her and Jack being connected to them. But can we blame her? The painful part was that this turned Jackie even further against Pat. In addition to what we talked about last episode in KFM 13. Jackie did not want to attach the campaign image to these people, and These people are what Pat brought to the table. But Peter was in the same situation. The same situation as Pat. The same situation as Jackie. And Jackie felt for him. 
And that probably hurt Jackie and Pat's relationship even further. Quote, One of Peter's biggest problems was he was always a pariah in the Kennedy clan. Jackie and Peter were both misfits in that family. Neither ever felt they really belonged. Both were much more sophisticated and refined than the Kennedys. Jackie felt very sorry for Peter because she knew what he was going through. James Spada. It's like they all three didn't have anywhere to really belong because yeah. she Pat couldn't be fully accepted into the Kennedys. Her friends weren't really... Her friends? Her friends. She didn't really belong with Peter. It was just not a good situation. At this point, Pat and Peter are both seeing other people. They have three kids and their home life is cold and tense. But they were both committed to one thing. Both committed to a common goal. Electing Jack. And they each did what they needed to not be got down. So the worst things got, people noticed that all of a sudden, Pat and Peter's dynamics changed. Quote, We would play poker every weekend with the Lawfords, and all of a sudden, the two were calling each other Bunny and Baby, all kinds of sweet names. Our group was their closest friends, and yet they were doing this. I remember it so vividly. I had a feeling it was just for our benefit, so that no one would pick up on the fact that they weren't living as husband and wife. Somebody said, you can't make waves now. You're going to make this work until he's president. On February 7th, 1960, Teddy, Jack, and his entourage landed in Vegas to have a little too much fun. A little break from the duties of the campaign. Actually, he ended up working on this trip too. He hosted a press conference at the Sands Hotel on this trip, but much fun was had as well. That evening, they had dinner at Frank's table in the garden room of the Sands Hotel, and guess who was in attendance? A 25-year-old brunette by the name of Judith Campbell. The significance of her relation to JFK and a man named Sam Flood is coming soon to a podcast near you. Blood and Business. Remember Ocean's Eleven, the movie script that originally belonged to Pat and Peter? Somehow, that now solely belonged to Frank. And he placed, in every role, one of his guys. Peter, Sammy Davis Jr., Dean Martin. It was basically the Rat Pack in a movie. They drank and laughed and smoked, slept around, and were rarely ever home. Pat was now starring as an extra in Peter's life, watching from backstage while he and his shiny friends had the time of their lives in the spotlight. Then, just as Pat is trying to get her feet under her, trying to decide what she can work with from here, the power position shifts. Now, Peter is at her feet. Now she finds herself on the golden throne. Because who is the actor, Peter Lawford? Who is the singer, Frank Sinatra, when Jack Kennedy is the new president of the United States of America and he's your loyal big brother? Running for the door, she was stopped in the dark. The glass had been shattered, and as she turned to look back, she really saw them for the first time. She saw plastic smiles and puppet strings. She saw dirt, cracked masks, and broken dreams. Like a miserable carnival, cursed to never turn off the rides. Should she turn and run, or should she find a place to hide? Relax, said the nightman. I've got some tricks up my sleeve. You can check out any time you'd like, but you can never leave. Welcome to the Hotel California. They were at the helm during the most turbulent moment in American history. 
the rumors are legion. Some sincere, some slander. They gave everything to their country. But what did it look like behind closed doors? In their homes? The most intimate moments of their time on Earth. Sometimes the truth is more wild than the headlines. They seemed to live the easy life, but they lost it all in an instant. They ran faster, worked harder, burned brighter, and then they were gone. You have just listened to The Kennedy Siblings, episode 14 from Blood and Business. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please give us a review on Apple, rate us on Spotify, and share Blood and Business with a friend or a sibling. If you'd like to support the show, the best way is to become a patron of Blood and Business. You will get bonus content every month, including a monthly bonus episode, interactive main episodes, and behind the scenes footage. To keep up with us day to day, you can follow us at Blood and Business on Instagram and TikTok. You can find the link for Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon in the show notes below. Thank you so much for the support, and we will see you back here next week for your regularly scheduled programming on Blood and Business. The main sources for this episode were Sinatra and the Jack Pack by Michael Sheridan with Dave Harvey and The Kennedy Women by Lawrence Lemer. To see a complete list of sources for all Blood and Business episodes, head on over to Patreon for a free PDF download.